Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap. The leading story for this week is Intel poaching distinguished engineer Tom Peterson from NVIDIA. This is a major news item. It's important for a lot of reasons, even if you don't follow industry people, because Tom has been an internal advocate at NVIDIA and has uh, made some pushes for things that consumers or media or partners have concerns, demands, or questions about internally. So NVIDIA is losing that person, also a key engineer. And this is where Intel's building battle against the two incumbent GPU makers expands because Intel has been already acquiring AMD talent, media reporter talent, and is now pulling people from NVIDIA. So that'll be our leading story for today. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's Z390 Dark motherboard. The Z390 Dark is a flagship motherboard for Intel's unlocked k -SKU CPUs with tuning done by overclock engineering team Kinpin and Tin to enable higher memory and CPU frequencies. The motherboard uses a unique rotated socket design to move EPS 12 volt cables to the right side, making cable management easier, and also sticks to two DIMM slots to improve memory overclocking stability and headroom. We previously analyzed the VRM in full and found it among the best in class for Z390 overclocking, and it also got rid of RGB LEDs. Learn more at the link in the description below. Quick GN store update first. We just restocked the blue beer glasses, so if you want one of the cobalt blue beer glasses with the gold tinted rim, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net, pick them up in one, two, or four packs for discounts as you go up, and uh, those will be there for you if you want them. So NVIDIA losing a key engineer to Intel. This, let me tell you why you need to care about this first. Tom Peterson, as I said, has been an internal advocate for media. And this means uh, every company sort of has at least one person who is a, a hub for transacting between the corporate people at the company and the people outside of the company. And that hub or that conduit is critical if they're good at their job because they keep the rest of the company uh, sort of slightly in check to some extent, or at least in touch with the audience. And as companies grow, they, they do lose touch with what the audience wants because they don't need to care anymore when they're in a dominating position. So NVIDIA losing Tom is both exciting and concerning. On the exciting side, Intel has now demonstrated that it's serious enough to start pulling on talent from the biggest GPU maker in the space. And it is starting by pulling on uh, someone who is, to our knowledge, a direct report to Jensen, uh, or extremely close, if not. So that's a, that's a big move. That's a power play by Intel. And the upside of that is that NVIDIA desperately needs competition because NVIDIA does act in a very controlling fashion with, uh, with its board partners, with media, and this is a concerning thing. Uh, NVIDIA also, though, is in this process losing someone who does help keep the company in touch with the rest of the world. And so the concerning side then on NVIDIA's front is that we don't know what's gonna happen, for example, the overclocking. We don't know, uh, Tom was pretty involved with overclocking. Tom was also involved with building the boost algorithm, uh, was involved with building benchmarking software and things like FCAT. If you remember that, he was, he was big on pushing frame time analysis. Uh, which of course we use heavily now, big on pushing VR benchmarking software and building it, and uh, did some engineering work on how the clock behaves for NVIDIA GPUs, has also listened very seriously to uh, points we've had and others have had about overclocking on NVIDIA hardware and locking NVIDIA hardware and things like that. So losing that conduit is, we're not sure how that'll impact NVIDIA in future generations. Now, these engineers, when they leave, you have to remember that they, they have already been working on the next product that's not out yet. So the impact from Raja at AMD, the impact from Tom at NVIDIA, that's going to carry on for at least another generation, although it will lessen as time goes on. But the, the immediate change is that Intel will be gaining a, an important engineer. So technically, at time of filming, this news is not public, but we have confirmed it with parties at both companies. Uh, so yeah, this is, uh, this is a, a big deal at this point. Um, we're not quite sure what'll happen, but in the very least, it looks like Intel is going to be a serious competitor to Nvidia. And then the big question after this is, you know, the, these people that Intel's pulling on, they all have 
influence, they have friends in the industry, and you'll notice that those people start coming on board afterward. Last week or two weeks ago, we had a news story about Intel hiring Kyle Bennett from Hard OCP. I think some of you misunderstood the hiring press thing and thought that it was like paying for reviews. That's not what it was. They literally hired Kyle Bennett. Like he doesn't, he doesn't really run Hard OCP anymore. So it's been mothballed, as he said. So Kyle Bennett works at Intel. Ryan Trout works at Intel. Raja Kadori works at Intel. Chris Hook works at Intel. All these people know each other. And uh, Alan Malventano, an excellent, uh, well, former writer on SSD reviews and now an employee of Intel, also works at Intel, as I just said. So uh, Intel's been really expanding its tendrils and pulling all these people on, and all these people know other people. So the, the question then is, who does Tom pull on, if anyone, from NVIDIA? That's really what we're wondering is, do any engineers follow and really start to build a, a serious GPU division at Intel that has a lot of experience, has worked at uh, on various successful and unsuccessful products. Both are important points on a resume because you know what failure is and you know what success is. So uh, it's, it's very interesting. And even if you don't really care about who industry people are, which is valid, uh, if you don't know their names, this is a major development and um, we'll see. We'll see. Intel's going to be a very interesting company over the next few years. Anyway, I uh, told you so. That's the next story. Asus has been distributing malware accidentally. There's a few things Asus has done lately that we've complained publicly about. And one of the biggest ones that we mentioned maybe a year or two ago was when Asus started using new update tools and started pre-installing uh, almost like root kits into the flash, uh, into flash that they put on motherboards so that when you booted a system for the first time, it would pop up all these driver install tools. Now on the surface, that looks like a nice consumer thing because it helps someone who doesn't know what they're doing to install drivers for the first time. Beyond that, the concern becomes that you've now put storage on the motherboard. And if that becomes exploitable, and it will be exploitable, then uh, you've now made a way for malware to revive itself after the OS has been cleared because it's on the motherboard. So that's the biggest thing we complained about with Asus and its security in recent years. And that's not even what we're talking about today. But it's probably something we're going to be talking about again when it's exploited and becomes an attack vector for malware, if it hasn't been already. Uh, so anyway, Asus has done some, some pretty not great things on the security front. Uh, according to... Kaspersky Lab, Asus's live update utility was recently hijacked and was used to spread malware that became known as Shadow Hammer. Shadow Hammer is a malicious backdoor. It masquerades as a, quote, critical security update, and it is now estimated to have affected over 1 million users. Asus being a leading vendor in the market, this is obviously a problem. The threat was detected in January, and it's estimated to have taken place between June and November of 2018. So you could be affected if you're using ASUS hardware. Making the attack so tricky to detect was the fact that the, the Trojanized utility used authentic certificates, ASUS Tech Computer Incorporated certificates, and was hosted on ASUS servers that uh, do the updates. So ASUS has since issued a press release and also a legitimate security update. It's also issued a diagnostic tool that users can use to determine if they are affected. And what was not issued, however, was an apology. Uh, what was not issued was an indication that ASUS is taking the matter overly serious. And the press release attempts to actually water down the findings of the security firm that discovered the attack. According to Kaspersky, Shadowhammer may be the largest supply chain attack ever discovered, rivaling the shadow pad and sea cleaner attacks, and is obviously of, of concern. So if you have uh, this ASUS software installed, the live update utility, you may want to get rid of it. And you may also want to use the ASUS published diagnostics tool to see if you're affected here, because it does affect a lot of people. Um, this isn't even like a, a browse safely thing and you'll be fine. This is a, if it's on your computer, you might not be fine. So also, if there's, uh, if you're using a board with ASUS firmware, that's another point of concern for the future. So just keep that in mind. Um, 
Bad moves by Asus on the security front. Intel 9th gen processors transitioning to a new stepping. So Intel uses revised steppings to correct errors in the processors. They use them to augment some of the properties of the processors, clock speeds, minor voltage changes, things like that. And uh, you'll see stepping sometimes where in the overclocking community, you might hear that one stepping is superior to others for overclocking for various reasons, maybe process maturity, or just because of changes in errata. They're prepping the platforms for the new 9th gen processors with an R0 stepping moving from P0 previously. According to ASUS, the newer chips using the R0 stepping ID will be coming in the second quarter. Thus far, there's no indication as to what the new stepping will bring specifically, but as stated, it's typically errata changes, small changes to clocks, things like that. Intel will also issue a specification update to detail the changes when the time has come. So once the processors are actually here, we'll know what's changing. Samsung tempers earning expectations amidst a memory price decline, something we've been talking about for a few weeks now. So in what has been an unprecedented move for Samsung, the company recently released a statement, or a warning rather, that its first quarter earnings expectations are anticipated to miss the mark. Quote, the company expects the scope of price declines in main memory chip products to be larger than expected. And this is something we noted in our last episode where memory prices are currently in a free fall with prices expected to hit lows not seen since 2011. Also affecting Samsung's earnings are the sluggish demand for display panels, which represents another sizable chunk of Samsung's business. Prices for both memory and display panels, specifically OLED, are expected to rebound, though, in the second half of the year. And as noted by Samsung officials, it has never before offered a statement before earnings reports. However, after having to revise the earnings guidance for fourth quarter 18, and again for the first quarter of 19 due to memory prices, Samsung has evidently decided it was time to break its code of silence. According to industry profits and clairvoyance Digitimes, PCIe SSDs are becoming more ubiquitous and look to be experiencing a surge to 50% market share in 2019. This will also achieve market share parity with 2.5 inch SSDs on the SATA interface and is a big move. The looming NAND oversupply and steep reduction in memory prices have led to 512 gigabyte PCIe SSD prices falling off by 11% in the first quarter of 2019 and 256 gigabyte options often see uh, similar price drops and have in the past couple of months. Throughout the year, one terabyte models are expected to come down as well, further narrowing the long-established price disparity between SATA and PCIe protocols. We previously reported about Intel and Micron parting ways on the joint venture to develop non-volatile memory, with each company agreeing to pursue new things, people. Pursue new non-volatile memory interests independently, and Intel with Optane and 3D Crosspoint, while Micron would follow on with Quant X. So it was a mutual departure. This, however, got a bit messy because uh, Doyle Rivers, one of the Intel engineers who jumped ship to Micron, allegedly brought Intel IP and trade secrets in tow to Micron uh, as moving over. So this is old news at this point, but what's new is that Intel has filed a lawsuit against Rivers, and Rivers, Micron, and Intel have been locked in a legal dispute since the filing. Most recently, Intel was awarded a court order that states Rivers, quote, shall not possess, use, or disclose any confidential, proprietary, or trade secret Intel documents related to 3D Crosspoint or Intel's Optane branded products, including about personnel working on those products that he acquired while working for Intel and that contain information Intel has not disclosed outside of Intel except under non-disclosure agreement protecting its confidentiality. And additionally, the court order gives Rivers three days to return any data that may be in his possession pursuant to the court order and Intel's lawsuit. According to his attorney, the embattled Rivers has nothing to return nor hide. Quote, Mr. Rivers doesn't have anything to return. This is uh, from Daniel Sakaguchi, an attorney defending Rivers. My apologies on the pronunciation. Quote, we continue to take the position that Intel's claims are greatly exaggerated. Intel's allegations are that Rivers brought a USB drive out of Intel when departing Intel with sensitive information on it. Rivers refutes those allegations, unsurprisingly, and states that the files are of personal or sentimental value to him and in no way constitute any IP or trade secret theft. 
The register has a thorough breakdown of the event so far. So if you want to learn more, we'll link their article in our show notes below. Uh, but that's kind of the news up to now of this event. DNA sequencing successfully used as a storage medium. How long until this one is exploited for malware? Perhaps we could ask ASUS. Apparently, DNA makes for a pretty good memory substrate. Sponsored by DARPA and Microsoft, several scientists at the University of Washington demonstrated proof of concept of DNA as a storage medium. The quote was, our device encodes data into a DNA sequence, which is then written to a DNA, oh boy, uh, uh, <laughs> oligonucleotide. Oligonucleotide using a custom DNA synthesizer pooled for liquid storage and read using a nanopore sequencer and a novel minimal preparation protocol. We demonstrate an automated five byte write, store, and read cycle with a modular design enabling expansion as new technology becomes available. So using this system, a, a simple five byte message, hello, was written and successfully stored and read out without data loss over a period of 21 hours. Scientists have long touted the potential for DNA as a storage medium and its potential over silicon and magnetic tape. Scientists and companies like Intel, Micron, and Microsoft are all invested in DNA storage. Most of the world's archival data is stored on magnetic tape. But there's hope that someday in the not so distant future, DNA will become the de facto archival storage technology. So that's it for this week's news recap. As always, subscribe for more to catch our reviews and other videos coming up this week and our factory tours, the ones that are left. You can also go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to catch our newest behind the scenes video. We have another one going up in a few days on Patreon or store.gamersnexus.net to help us out there as well. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.